Because Brooklyn currently expanding. Actually, it is expanding at a very high rate. You finally flip. Now, the interesting thing about this is, one, I could have never come up with something like this. Just, if you're following the math, and we believe that these claims are true, it would explain a lot. Because if our observed Big Bang, we believe is about 14 billion years ago, I'm totally all right with that. So if at some point we start off in a very hot, dense state, okay, because I hear the interesting thing is they say we came from like high entropy, but then it, the, what was it that is it we came from high entropy, but we thought it was supposed to be low entropy, and now we're going supposed to be going more towards entropy and supposed to increase it with. It was low entropy. Yeah. But high energy, right? Mm. To high entropy. Hmm. Now, the interesting thing about that is if, if we play this out, at some point, everything would be recycles. Because in a lot of the other uh, models that they had, they have like the cyclic universe. Uh, so Roger Penrose basically believes we're kind of going through our existence and then it ends up then an aeon ends and then we kind of cross over and everything. And it's like, well, at that point, you just have black holes and photons. Maybe that's the case. Maybe that is what is happening. I don't know. That's why this is a conjecture. But that's also very boring. You just got black holes and photons. This, if true, would mean that things based upon this seem to go on forever. Now, it's limited. Finite in size, finite in volume, eternal in time. If there's one thing I've learned from Professor Sean Carroll, it's that eternity is a long time. But while looking at this and doing calculations, I just couldn't help but notice that one, this was the name of one of Dad's books, and number two, uh, while paying attention to a lot of work coming from Team Wolfram and everything, in uh, Professor Wolfram's book, A New Kind of Science, he had found, a, I believe, a... Uh, Two state five color machine. Well, oh, he's found the two five, and he's found that to be the simplest Turing machine at the time. And then he had found a two three Turing machine that he had conjectured was be the simplest Turing machine. He didn't know how to prove it. So back in 2007, he uh, basically came up with a prize. I think it was like ten or twenty thousand dollars. Is there anybody that could prove? that it was, in fact, the simplest Turing machine. So we have the Wolfram 2-3 machine. All right. So he put out that, uh, I think it was like in June or July or something. So by October, within six months, uh, Mike Smith, an actual college student studying computer science, he came up with a potential proof. He submitted it, and they went back and forth for several months. And again, there, there is controversy over this. I believe a lot of the major regulatory boards and stuff like that have not said that this fits their criteria for a universal Turing machine. Now, the reason why, or at least one of the reasons, is actually very interesting. We'll get into that in just a moment. But the claim was that this 2-3 machine, so it's two state and it's three color. Now, what initially piqued my interest, because I'm like, two, three, that makes five. We got five of those. All right, that's cool. And then I'm like, ah, yeah, just a coincidence. I kind of lost interest in it for a bit. And I revisited it again later. And then I noticed some of the uh, geometric objects that it would utilize. I'm like, okay. I believe, now I might be getting these wrong, but I believe it was something like this. It's like, all right. Oh, look, it's generating triangles. Well, those are important. The Gieskin manifold is decomposed, is, uh, excuse me, is created from uh, a tetrahedron. The figure eight knot is composed of a double cover, those two tetrahedrons. So triangles we'd think would be important. And also one of the other objects. It was a lollipop path. I'm like, wait, a circle? And then a point coming out there too? 
Well, now we've built in a loop there. I've noticed uh, things that look somewhat similar to this in some of Jonathan Gorod's quantum uh, circuitry diagrams and everything. And I'm like, okay, I remember being here for, I think, either the first or second time we were sitting down and you're doing that thing where it's like, all right, you're on, you're on planet Earth, we assume it's a sphere. You start off, where's the one point you can go where it's like, you go a mile this way, you go a mile this way, you go a mile this way, and then you're back where you started. And you're like, oh, there's only one point there if you did that from there, but then you actually fit, do the calculation. It's like, wait, if you start just far enough away, you could walk around and go up, and then you could just literally go back. And it's like, huh, that's very interesting. But what also, what really, really turned me on to this was that I remembered something in Thad's book that really, uh, it really rang a bell. And it was a, the term helicoidal collapse. I don't think I'm going to spell this wrong, but it's helicoidal collapse. Now, do I know exactly what that means? No. Have I seen the animations in Wikipedia? Yes. But what I take from this is once the dimensions of our reality, if we're going to assume we literally came from nothing, just infinitely just random waves, because that's what people usually like to start out with, if that was the case, what if there was a parameterization of our five dimensions, if that parameterization, once that occurred, if it was to attain the simplest balanced format, the claim is that we go from those five dimensions, we collapse down into what eventually becomes, I believe, R4, the hyperbolic spacetime of general relativity. So I'm like, okay, there's a parameterization and then you have a change. It's almost like it's restarting there in order to run and be, well, in this case, to our knowledge, universal. The interesting thing about Adam Smith's machine over here, the Wolfram 2-3 machine, is the 2-2 machine has been proven it is not universal. So then the next step would be, is a 2-3 machine universal? Now, the main controversy, to my knowledge, comes in here where people disagree that it's universal is the machine restarts. And according to at least most people's definition of Turing machine, well, you're not supposed to restart it. Now, Team Wolfram, their claim was, according to Adam Smith's code, it is set up so that once the machine begins, the compiler begins to parameterize. And once it has hit the parameterization uh, schedule for what it is designed to do, it automatically restarts. There is no outside input. That is, the machine itself, once the compiler achieves the particular needed parameterization, it restarts. It performs its own restart. It performs its own restart. It's built in. It must happen. Because one of the things here is, you were explaining before how basically we're talking about like the symmetry between, or excuse me, asymmetry between two circles. So one might be a small circle, and the other is actually ginormous. And as they're twisting together, a couple of the axes are consumed, and then we would end up in this state, the hyperbolic figure eight knot, balanced by the end hypersphere of maximal volume. So a double cover of the minimum manifold, balanced by a maximal volume hypersphere, is what we're claiming here. And I just found that absolutely fascinating that that 2-3 machine, it goes through and within the compiler, it must restart. And upon that restart, the compiler has set it up that it actually becomes universal. And I believe, I, I think according to Wikipedia at least, they had it set uh, he took a tag equivalence. And actually, I'd love to learn more about uh, tag with you, but there was a form of tag that was universal. And basically, he did some form of uh, computational e equivalence between the 2-2 machine 
and that tag equivalence, and then with the additional degree of freedom once everything had been compiled, then the machine is universal, so to speak. Now, the efficiency of that machine, the big complaint was the code was long, it was bulky, but if this does hold as a proof for the minimal machine providing universal computation, I mean, I think that's pretty cool.